what's gonna do for people. Chef Mo, back in the place. This is episode two, Chef Life. Uh, I'll put a link to episode one right here, in case you haven't seen it yet. Uh, so, if you've come to this episode, well, welcome. Uh, in this episode, what we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna give you a little bit of an update on me. Uh, I've been releasing these videos basically about every month. Well, I've been making them, I haven't been releasing them yet. I'm kind of saving them up. Uh, kind of releasing them at all at the same time. So for you, basically, this will be totally irrelevant. Because you'll have one, hopefully, bi-weekly. Which is the schedule I'd like to get on. But this is, uh, you know, me starting this. So uh, you can see the trials and tribulations of that. So uh, I'll give you an update on what I've been doing for the past month or so. Um, doing Still on the Culinary Mercenary Tour. Uh, still kind of doing that. So we'll give you an update on that. We'll give you a uh, uh, a Little piece I did about what to bring on your first day, right? So because you know the show is supposed to be a little bit for new chefs and showing them how they're supposed to you know What it's like to actually be a working cook uh, So I'm gonna give you a little bit of prep on to show you what you need to bring on your first day So you'll know from my time working uh, from the last episode from the culinary mercenary tour thing you know that I worked at Marigold and Onions? Well, I got a special interview with uh, Chef Ashtad. Uh, he's the executive chef there. Uh, and I really liked his story and I really want, thought it might uh, be beneficial for you guys to hear. Uh, to see where he came from to actually become a chef. Get from the bottom and now he's there, you know what I mean? Started from the bottom, now the whole team's freaking here. Which makes sense because it's all snowy right now, check it out. Snowy without a Bentley. That's real Toronto, because you know, keeps it real around here. Yeah. Alright, so let's talk about the last month. Uh, I gotta tell you, it's been really slow. Uh, it's been January in Toronto is typically a very slow month in restaurants uh, just because the holidays are done nothing really happens until basically all of this stupid snow melts and then everybody can get back to kind of normal you know um, but until then it's dirty slow and when you're a freelancer like me that means you sit at home so I've done a lot of sitting at home lately and I don't like sitting at home which is Part of the reason why I came out today. Let's see, I uh, started off the month uh, doing a freelance gig working up at Blue Mountain Collingwood uh, in the middle of a blizzard, which was ridiculous. Um, like snow drifts, four feet high, it was unbelievable. Uh, but they're a great crew up there, thanks to Rusty's up at Blue Mountain. Uh, you can check. And I also shot a little bit of this. need a little time-lapse footage that I shot. Um, I also did some footage at a party I was making donuts at. But after that it was really really slow for the most part. I did shoot an interview with Ash, which you'll see later, but uh, it's hard when you're not working, especially when you got rent to pay, you know what I mean? Uh, it's one problem that I've had a lot lately. I've been dealing with the blues, I'm not going to lie. Just feeling, you know, a little bummed out, a little worried about, you know, where I'm going to live and stuff like that. Last thing I want to do is, you know, be out on the street, but that's kind of the fun part about living on the edge, isn't it? You get to live on the edge all the time, and you... You don't know whether you're going to live in a house or not. Wow. So that's, I guess, the first lesson for new chefs is that be prepared. This is uh, not a, a very secure industry to be in. The good thing is, is that if you're smart, you can play around and kind of work your own magic. Luckily, in the past couple of years, I've been able to um, 
get better opportunities everywhere I've gone, which is kind of nice. Uh, now I've just decided that I wanted to work kind of for myself, which is, it, it gives it its own challenges. Being a self-employed, you need to have a lot of discipline as well, uh, and that's one thing that I've been learning a lot lately, uh, and I'm trying to work on getting better at. I mean, hey, that's what life's about, right? Getting better at things. Uh, ooh, my arm's getting sore. But uh, the good news is, is that I've finally got myself a new gig. Uh, two of them, actually. Um, I'm still ironing out the details at the time when I'm shooting this, so I'm not going to name them right now. Uh, but I'll put links in the bottom there, and you can go check it out. And hey, maybe I can, you know, cook you brunch, or even come into your house and kind of show you some things, which would be kind of fun. Uh, I'm very looking forward. I did one day of the private chef thing. I'm very looking forward to seeing it again. Uh, it was kind of interesting and fun uh, to kind of go in and kind of, you know, work on your own, make a bunch of stuff like that. So hopefully it'll work out. That's about it, I guess, for the month of January. Uh, I gotta walk all the way back now and uh, go to the grocery store. So, I said I was going to give you something, look at the camera Morgan, uh, I said I was going to give you something about what to bring on your first day, so I shot this little piece showing you inside a little bit of my knife bag and what I bring every day to work, so check this out. Cooking is a trait. It takes skill, knowledge, and hard physical work to create something that is hopefully beautiful and delicious in the end. And the tools of the cooking trade are super important. Some tools are handy and useful. Others are bothersome and really end up taking up too much space and doing more harm than good. So rather than telling you what knives to buy, I thought it might be helpful to show you what I carry around with me when I go to work. French knife. This is where it starts and ends with me. If you left me on a deserted island with just one knife, it would be one like this. I'd also bring You've Come a Long Way Baby by Fatboy Slim, Lord of the Flies, and both Kill Bill movies. But for cooking everything, this is it right here. Uh, it's typically about 6 to 12 inches long, about an inch to 2 inches wide. Uh, it's got a curved blade. Uh, which is typically used for cutting large slabs of beef, but really, I use this thing for just about everything. This is a Santoku knife. Now, Santoku translates in Japanese to three virtues, uh, which means the three types of cutting action that you get from this knife. Slicing, dicing, and mincing. It's meant to be kind of an everything kind of knife, uh, like the French knife, but it's got some different features. It's typically shorter and thinner than a French knife. It also has a flat blade rather than one like the French knife. It's curved to a bit more of a point. Uh, it's got a rounded curve on this end, which is called a sheep's foot. The Santoku knives will also have little tiny bumps. I don't know if you can see those little tiny bumps along there. Uh, this is called a, called a Garnton Edge. Uh, it's meant to keep food from sticking to the side of the blade, um, which is really helpful for cutting things like potatoes. Really, when it comes down to which one of these guys you're going to use, it uh, comes down to preference. Uh, there's another one that I didn't own have in my bag, which is called a Gyoto, which is a lot thinner. I'll show you a picture of it now. Uh, it's a lot thinner, a lot smaller. Uh, really, when it comes down to what you're going to use, it comes down to preference. I will typically go with this just because that's what I've learned. With. 
paring knife. Uh, this guy is designed to do all of your lighter, delicate, smaller work. Uh, things like peeling vegetables or fruits, uh, cleaning shrimp, or getting delicate or getting fancy with some uh, little garnishes. Uh, it's typically about two inches long. Uh, usually, we'll have a point on the end. Uh, and if you're poor like me, and you really only can afford to get two knives, uh, really, it's these two. Uh, do everything kind of with your French knife and all your delicate stuff with your paring knife. And that's really all you need. This guy, you're not really going to get much use out of unless you're doing butchery. But when you do, oh man, this guy's going to come in handy. Typically, it's a medium-sized knife, so somewhere in the middle of those two guys. It's got a flexible blade, which you can use to get into thin, tight spaces and get things like skin and tear meat away from bones and stuff like that. Very handy, but not as useful as some other knives. Bread knife. Uh, this should be the only serrated blade in your whole bag. Serrated means that it has these little teeth right here, uh, which act like a saw blade. Uh, these are very, very good for things that you don't want to apply a lot of pressure to, like bread. Uh, the problem with a serrated blade is that it tends to make a very messy cut. Uh, it pulls most of the material that you're cutting through with it, which for bread really doesn't matter. But I've seen people use these to cut tomatoes, and the problem with those is because of the not too much pressure thing. Uh, because of the messy cut though, it tends to pull most of the pith, the seedy part, it tends to pull most of the pith out of the tomato, it turns your tomatoes mushy really, really fast. So don't use one of those. If you keep this sharp, as you always should, this will do you just fine. Honing steel, otherwise known as a chef's steel or as a butcher's steel, and notice I did not say sharpening. Not meant to sharpen, it only helps to realign the edge of your blade. They are usually this long, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, they can be made of ceramic or steel or if you really fancy, diamond. They uh, And they're usually really only meant for light maintenance on your blade. If you really want to sharpen it, uh, it takes a little bit of time and a little bit of precision, especially if you use a whetstone. But typically, the first thing I do every time I pick up my blade when I first start is hone it up. Cooking is chemistry. Take one thing, put it with another thing, usually add some heat in some way, and voila! You've made something new. That's science, friend. And any good scientist will tell you it's all about controls and monitoring and so will any good pastry chef. So it helps to keep a good cooking thermometer with you at all times. Uh, pro tip for the week, to calibrate this, uh, boil a pot of water, uh, throw it in, only to the tip, do not let the bottom touch, do not let the tip touch the bottom of the pot. If yeast does not read 100 degrees Celsius or 212 degrees Fahrenheit, you need to record that offset, friend. Oh, and always cook chicken to 76 degrees Celsius or 165 degrees Fahrenheit. Don't ask how I know that. There are a lot of good quotes for this one. Uh, label date refrigerate comes to mind. But uh, really, I remember back to my old chef who used to look at me and say, Mo, put a label on that. Or I will kill you. And that one really stuck with me. So early on, I always learned to carry with me a uh, permanent fine tip marker. Um, and don't forget, if you put a label on something, also put the date on it. Because nobody wants to play a game of smell this. Now there's a lot of other things that you could have in your bag. Uh, tweezers and tongs, spatulas, sharpeners, all kinds of things. I carry around measuring cups with me because every once in a while they've come in handy. But really, with these eight items, you can go into any professional kitchen and do just about anything. So, you want to see what kind of the end of the road looks like? Well, 
did an interview with my friend Ash. He's the executive chef at Marigold and Onions Catering. Uh, he gives a little bit of his backstory and tells you what it takes to be to get to where he is. So take a look. Hi, my name is Ashdad, also known as Ash, mostly known as Ash, and I'm very lucky to be the executive chef at Marigolds and Onions, one of Toronto's premier catering and event production companies. I welcome you, and I welcome you to my kitchen. First of all, I grew up as a fat kid, and being fat and my connection with food have always been amazing. Of course, I was a glutton in my family, so, I mean, what else can I say? But I remember this one time, my mom would always go to the corner butcher store and get fresh chickens that needed to be plucked, then gotten fresh at home. And one day I walked into the kitchen and I asked her if I could help her clean it. And the memory is so vivid because I just really enjoyed the touch, the feel, the process of just getting the chicken into my hands and just completely deboning it, cutting it into curry-sized pieces that you would then marinate. And at that point, I was probably seven or eight years old and I just knew that my connection with food will always be for a lifetime. And I think that's the way that I started getting to know and understanding that this was my calling. And here I am, 35 years later, this is what I do for a living. Uh, I started doing uh, a bachelor's in hotel management in India, which I completed uh, in 2003. Uh, in India, I've been very honored to have had training in some of the most prestigious five-star luxury hotels that India has to offer, namely the Taj Mahal Palace in Bombay, and also the ITC Group of Hotels, which is one of uh, Southeast Asia's biggest uh, hotel chains that I've trained at. And I then furthered myself by going to do an, uh, a master's course in Italian Renaissance culinary arts in Piedmont, Italy. It was in Italy that was the major turning point in my life as a chef and it just completely blew my mind. The idea of being in a culture where food was everything, where food meant existence, where food was life. People didn't they didn't, they didn't eat to live, they lived to eat. And that was something that really, really turned me around and just got me so obsessed with not only the culture, but also the cuisine. And eventually I went back to India and then I finally decided that I had to uproot myself from that one particular place and explore the world. At this restaurant that I opened after I got back to India, once I completed my masters in Italy, it was in the city of Pune, where I'm from. The restaurant was called La Dolce Vita. It was my first Italian-run trattoria that I operated as executive chef and general manager for three years. And within three years of its operation, I was able to get that restaurant from being about the eighth best in the city to the second best in the city. That was a major break for me in Italian food. In 2009, I landed for the first time out east in Brunswick, a small city called Miramichi, which was the stepping stone to my career in Canadian cooking. Minus 35 degree weather for the very first time, I had no idea what I was getting myself into, but I can tell you it was one of the most amazing experiences that have finally gotten me to where I am today. And I'm so lucky to be in a country like Canada and cook the food that I am able to cook today. I've been here for the past six years. I've uh, been in, in Toronto since 2010. And I've been really, really lucky and excited to have started my culinary journey here at this wonderful, wonderful company. Oh yes, tips for prospective chefs. I get that a lot. So for me, if you know that you want to be a chef, you have to be ready for two things. One discipline. It is such a core need to have a very regimented life, especially when you are a chef, just because of the fact that once you enter any kitchen, you have to be ready and mentally prepared to know 
that what you're about to get into is something really tough. It's really gruesome. And what you see on TV is not what you're going to experience when you get into the real world. Two, passion and dedication for what you do. That's why the cliche is saying, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. You have to be passionate for what you do in anything that you do. It's just not the kitchen. But especially when it comes to food, you have to understand you're feeding your soul to a prospective customer who's going to look at you, your personality, on a plate. These are my two biggest tips. All the best. So uh, that's it. We're done. That's another episode. Uh, I want to thank Chef Ash and everybody at Marigold and Onions for going in and letting me do that there. That was like super cool. Um, if you like this, then like it with the little thumbs up thingy because that would be cool. And maybe share it around to your friends. Uh, you can always hit me up on social media, uh, chefmoToronto.com for everything, pretty much. So any sort of social media, chefmoToronto.com is the answer. Uh, what else can I say about this? I'm trying to keep the sunlight in. Uh, I'm gonna probably go home and edit this all together so that I have another final episode. Yeah! Uh, so I just wanted to say thank you very much for joining me. Uh, like and share it and subscribe and all that stuff. Find me on the social media and all that stuff. Find out what I'm doing next. Uh, and that's about it. So thank you again. Episode out too. Like this. The deuces. Zoom out far away, deuces to uses. Chef Mo, I'm out. Hey, did you like that video? Well, if you did, check out some of these other videos. Or if you want to get updated on the new stuff, subscribe to the channel. If you want all the new information, just visit ChefMoToronto.com.